Well, the reason that I decided to talk about this uh, today is because of a new book that has just come out. And uh, it's called Countdown. It's by Professor Shana Swan, uh, who's at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine in, in New York. And she is uh, quite renowned around the world as an epidemiologist, especially dealing with reproduction matters. And the whole tenet of this book is that sperm counts have been falling very significantly in recent years. And uh, that the uh, outcome of this is uh, potentially catastrophic for the population. And there are many, many articles that have reviewed the book. Uh, it has been a, a topic of conversation uh, globally uh, because of the suggestion that uh, <laughs> uh, the human race may actually be eventually wiped out because we are not going to reproduce properly. <clears throat> So what is causing this? Uh, according to Dr. Swan, who is not alone in this, I mean, there are a lot of other researchers uh, in this uh, area who feel that there are many, many chemicals in the environment today that are responsible for uh, somehow ha having an effect on fertility, uh, on reproduction. And uh, she points a finger at many cosmetics, uh, including the packaging, the, the plastics, uh, some of the food that we eat because of pesticide uh, residues, the cleaning agents, uh, various other chemicals that we use. <laughs> and indeed, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of chemicals that we use on, on a daily basis. Uh, she, for example, will uh, tell us that uh, the mean sperm count has been uh, falling. And when we compare it, for example, to plastic production, that has been rising. Now, there may be a connection here, but of course, you cannot infer that just from looking at uh, a graph like this. This is an association. It cannot prove a cause and effect relationship. Because, uh, of course, we've also seen a, a rise, let's say, in the use of, of internet, the internet. So, uh, you know, we're not going to suggest that the use of internet is responsible for the falling uh, sperm count. However, this is not uh, to be dismissed because it is possible that there are some chemicals uh, in plastics that are responsible for this. So we're going to have a close look at this business which I'll call the endocrine disruptor uh, conundrum. It is indeed a conundrum, as, as you will experience. There are no simple answers here. It is an extremely complicated issue, but um, it, it behooves us to be aware of this and at least to uh, discuss this on somewhat of a scientific uh, level. <clears throat> First of all, just a, a quick review of what we mean by the endocrine system. These are glands in the body that produce hormones that can travel through the bloodstream and trigger some sort of reaction somewhere else in, in the body. Uh, so, uh, for example, the pituitary gland can send out a signal telling the body pr to produce growth hormone, and then the body follows that uh, those instructions. A uh, message can also come from... Uh, uh, from the, the brain telling the ovaries to release an egg. So that we're dealing with uh, hormones here. And obviously, because uh, these hormonal systems are, are so critical to life, anything that interferes with them is going to have some sort of an important uh, effect. <clears throat> the literature on uh, chemicals that can disrupt uh, hormonal function is, is vast. Thousands and thousands of research papers have been written on this. But indeed, there's a great deal of controversy uh, here because we're dealing with very, very complicated issues, and uh, it really is not possible to, to simplify this. I mean, we try to attach numbers, of course, because science revolves around numbers. We're always trying to measure things. However, in the case of, of uh, endocrine-disrupting chemicals, the effects can be due to, to vanishingly small amounts of these substances, which makes uh, it very difficult to, to have uh, significant conclusions about this. <clears throat> Just to give you an idea of how little hormones are involved in our life and how important they are, uh, what you're looking at here is the pituitary gland, rather remarkable picture taken through uh, optical fiber. Uh, 
the pituitary gland is extremely important in releasing hormones into, into the body, but the amount is just about one microgram, that's one millionth of a gram daily. And yet our life depends on this. So very small amounts of hormones are active. So obviously very small amounts of chemicals that can disrupt hormones need to be paid attention to. <laughs> Well, the first time that we started to, to engage in discussions about the possible uh, detriments of environmental chemicals uh, was way back in 1960s when Silent Spring was published by Rachel Carson with the suggestion that pesticides are playing uh, havoc with uh, the life of birds in the environment. And this was our, our you know, first uh, suggestion that substances that were kind of callously released into the environment would have consequences. By 1992, uh, researchers began to notice that the quality of, of uh, semen, quality of sperm was, was decreasing. And in uh, 1993, uh, falling sperm counts were confirmed as were some disorders of the male reproductive tract that had not been seen uh, before. Uh, the same year, uh, some <laughs> researchers noted, I'm not sure how they ever came to, to note this, uh, that uh, there were uh, various kind of toxins in Lake uh, Apopka in Florida, and this was linked to a reduced size of the penis of alligators. Uh, that might have been quite an interesting piece of research to do. Uh, I think this is something that would be given to graduate students uh, in order to uh, measure the uh, penises of alligators. Anyway, they seem to be uh, shrinking. <clears throat> the same year, uh, launched this book uh, by Theo Colburn called Our Stolen Future, which for the first time made available to the general public the story of these endocrine uh, disruptors. And this is when we really began to be concerned about uh, uh, this uh, topic, uh, because this was the book that really introduced the term endocrine disruptor <clears throat> into common language. <clears throat> so what do we mean by uh, endocrine uh, disruptors? Um, hormones carry out their function by stimulating activity inside of a cell. But in order to do that, they have to enter the cell. And uh, if you have a hormone mimic, that is a chemical that looks like a hormone to the cell, it will also allow that to enter the cell. So in this case, you can have excessive hormonal activity beyond what is natural if you have substances that can mimic the action of a hormone. Consequently, you can also have substances that can block the action of hormones by blocking receptor sites on cells. So endocrine disruptors can do two things. They can either increase hormonal activity or they can reduce hormonal activity, neither of which, of course, is, is desirable. It is also very difficult to determine exactly what these hormone disruptors are doing. For example, bisphenol A, which we'll talk about in detail a little bit uh, later, uh, if you want to determine exactly what it is capable of doing in the body, uh, it's not easy because it depends on where you are looking. Uh, as you can see from here, if you are assessing its activity in the liver or in the ovaries, you don't find that it does anything. However, if you are uh, taking a look at uh, its presence in the brain and in breast tissue, then you can determine that it actually does have an effect. So it depends on exactly where you are looking, if you're going to see if a chemical has an effect or, or, or not. Now, what can that effect be? There are all sorts of, of um, allegations that have been made about hormone disruptors, uh, because by interfering with what natural hormones can do, they can lead to obesity, they can lead to breast cancer, uh, they can lead to infertility, all of these are possible. So, of course, this brings up the question of what do we do to protect ourselves from these substances and where do we encounter them? <clears throat> well, here we run into our first significant problem uh, because chemicals that in the laboratory have been shown 
to have hormone disruptive effects can be found in everything, as you can see, ranging from children's toys to personal care products. So avoiding these things is virtually impossible. Uh, we may be able to reduce our exposure to some, but total elimination is not possible. But there's something else that I really do want to call your attention to. Uh, and that is that activity that is seen in a Petri dish in the laboratory is not necessarily mimicked in the human body. So when we say that, that uh, uh, chemicals in children's toys, for example, the phthalates can be a problem, we say that because this has been investigated in the laboratory. Uh, we don't have all that much real clinical evidence, although there is some, as, uh, as you will see. But the scope of these environmental disrupting substances is, is vast. Uh, and this gives you uh, an idea of substances that we can be exposed to, ranging anyway from arsenic to glycol ethers, which is found in, in cosmetic products, or fluoride in, in toothpaste, uh, PBDE, that's a flame retardant. I mean, these things are found in all kinds of consumer uh, products. And many of them we cannot avoid because they essentially come from industry. Uh, if you take a just a, a cursory look here, you see that that uh, agricultural runoff is uh, a, a possible source. We find them in, in seawater, uh, industrial municipal uh, uh, effluents. I mean, these are things that the average person cannot uh, do anything about, and we are exposed to these kind of uh, substances, uh, and. In this case, uh, there really is nothing that, that we can do. What is the consequence? Well, uh, we do know, for example, that some of these substances are linked to uh, very kinds of uh, congenital abnormalities, uh, breast cancer in men, sexual dysfunction, testicular cancer. So one can kind of paint a rather dire picture of, of what is going on. Uh, because there are just so many of these substances that in the laboratory have been demonstrated to have endocrine effects, and the possibility exists that they have some role to play in human uh, disease. This is why we are seeing um, various kinds of admonitions that we should be staying away from things like bisphenol A and phthalates, which are common endocrine disruptors. So what I would like to do is to use these as an example and take a careful look, uh, put numbers to it as much as possible to give you an idea of what is known, what is not known, and just how worried we should be about these uh, uh, substances. But before we launch into bisphenol A and phthalates, it is also very important to understand that there are a whole host of substances that are present in nature that have endocrine disrupting properties. For example, isoflavones in the soybeans that you're looking at here, those have estrogenic properties. The same can be said for hummus, uh, which of course is uh, made from uh, uh, chickpeas. Similarly, flaxseed has various chemicals called lignans, which have hormone-like properties. Oregano is another one. And uh, so is milk, because of course, cows naturally produce hormones. And these hormones are present in, in the milk. And uh, wine also contains a compound called resveratrol, which we've talked about before, because of its potential medicinal properties in reducing uh, uh, aging, but it also has endocrine disrupting uh, properties. So it is not only synthetic substances that, that uh, we have to take a look at, we have to take a look at the naturally occurring substances in the environment too. And just because something occurs in nature does not mean that it is safe. As I've told you many times, uh, you cannot equate natural to safe and synthetic to dangerous. That's not how things work. The only way we know if something is safe or not is by studying it. So there certainly are substances in the environment that are endocrine disruptors.
factors. Of course, that doesn't mean that this should take away any attention from the synthetic chemicals because these are not mutually exclusive. So we may be exposed to the natural uh, endocrine disruptors, which also may have some disrupting effect, but that doesn't mean that we should ignore the synthetic ones. The, uh, the ones that have received a great deal of attention and the ones that uh, Shana Swan really focuses on uh, are the phthalates. And uh, this uh, is a, a whole class of chemicals. They have one uh, general chemical structure with varying details. In uh, organic chemistry, we use the term R very much as one might use the term X in mathematics. So it can refer to a whole range of, of so-called substituents. But uh, what all the phthalates have in common is this um, basic structure. However, uh, depending on what is attached to this basic structure, there can be very dramatic differences. And that's also an important point to understand that we cannot generalize. We cannot say that all phthalates are problematic. Some of them are, and we know, again, from laboratory experiments, which, which those are. Now, the fact is that phthalates are very often used as so-called plasticizing agents, particularly in polyvinyl chloride items, in PVC, because they will make the plastic soft and flexible but they are not attached, the phthalates are not attached chemically to the plastic. They are just mixed in with the plastic and therefore they can leach out and migrate into the air, into the food and into other uh, materials. So for example, a shower curtain would be an example. A shower curtain is made of PVC polyvinyl chloride, but of course you want it to be soft and flexible. And the phthalates are mixed in with the PVC to accomplish this. But they will also outgas. And as you know, when you open that bag of a new shower curtain, it has a smell. People say it has a plastic smell. Well, part of that plastic smell are the phthalates that are used to soften it. Is this an issue? Well, there certainly is. Uh, phthalate presence in the air when you take a shower, especially if the shower curtain is new. Is that enough to have an effect? Impossible to say. All we can do is make an educated guess. Uh, the exposure here would be very, very small. The time spent uh, being exposed would be very small. Uh, but overall, it might add something to the overall body burden of all of these uh, uh, chemicals. Uh, Shana Swan, for example, uh, recommends uh, using uh, other shower curtains, and you can find cotton shower curtains or polyester shower curtains, which don't have any phthalates leaching out of them. Similarly, uh, the so-called rubber duckies, which actually are not rubber duckies, they're polyvinyl chloride duckies, and in order to make them uh, soft and flexible, they are treated with phthalates. Does this mean that children should not play with them? No, but it is probably not a good idea to give children toys that they will put into their mouth uh, that can leach out uh, phthalates. And indeed, children do tend to put a lot of toys into their, uh, into their mouths. But you can get uh, duckies that are made of real rubber, not made of polyvinyl uh, chloride uh, plastic. <laughs> Uh, fingernail polish also in order to conform nicely to the nail uh, will have uh, phthalates. That is a source of exposure. The ink that is used in on uh, some pizza boxes, uh, that ink, of course, has to be flexible because the cardboard has to be flexible here. That is uh, accomplished by using diisobutyl phthalate. Uh, fragrances <clears throat> uh, very often are mixed together with phthalates because the phthalate will prevent the too rapid loss of, of, of scent. So these chemicals indeed are used all over the place. Well, Shana Swan first started her research when she was still at the University of Rochester because she has had a long career in, in, in this business and she has been interested in, in uh, this business of endocrine uh, disruptors. 
And uh, some of her original work was pretty interesting because it dealt with the so-called anogenital distance. That's the distance between the anus and the genitals. And uh, her original research was on male mice. And what she found was that when mothers of these mice had been exposed to, to phthalates throughout their pregnancy, and they gave birth to these pups, the pups had an unusually short anogenital uh, distance. Now, you might think that this has uh, no relevance, uh, but there actually is some because that anogenital distance is hormonally determined. So in this case, exposure to uh, the mothers to, to phthalates had this effect on the offspring. So this is a reproductive uh, problem. And so in uh, rodent fetuses, when there were high doses of diethylhexophthalate uh, in, in, in the mothers, it seems that the effect is to block the synthesis <coughs> of testosterone. Testosterone <coughs> is the male sex hormone. So essentially the finding here was that these mice, the male mice were tending to be more female because their mothers had been exposed to the, the phthalates. She then went on to do very similar studies in uh, humans, in boys, and measured the anogenital distance among male infants and determined once again that the higher the blood level of phthalates in the mothers, the shorter the anogenital distance in, in the males. However, uh, when you look at the numbers, which is always interesting, as I said, you know, in science, we look at the numbers. So she measured the distance in 106 boys and, and looked at uh, high maternal versus low exposure and did find the shorter anogenital distance with high exposure. However, the difference was only about 3 to 4%. <clears throat> That's not a very large number. And uh, the experimental error when you try to measure this anogenital distance is quite significant because this is not an easy thing to measure. And uh, so the difference of three to 4% is, is not all that meaningful because it's very close to the margin of experimental error. Nevertheless, it's an interesting finding. Uh, however, it's also important to point out that no health consequence of this was noted. So indeed it was basically a cosmetic finding uh, without any uh, real consequence. But again, it just uh, is another point that demonstrates that exposure to a mother can have an effect on the offspring, even though there was no health consequence uh, to it. Now, there have been some studies where there was some health consequence noted, not in terms of the anogenital distance, but in, in, in terms of uh, uh, the uh, descent of testicles. Uh, this is a, a, a relatively common problem in boys when the uh, testicle doesn't descend. And in this case, uh, there was a link with the amount of uh, uh, phthalate that was found in the mother's urine. And even more consequently, consequentially, the boys had smaller uh, penises. So as you can imagine, that is uh, of some concern uh, because uh, again, we're looking here at a possibility of, of reproductive uh, malfunction. Of course, the uh, animal rights activists uh, will jump on a study like this and uh, look at this headline, eating buffalo wings could affect your unborn penis size. A uh, rather tenuous connection. Uh, what they're talking about here is that when you buy these buffalo wings, they might be wrapped in plastic and that plastic may leach phthalates into the food and therefore it may cause this problem. I think that is uh, somewhat of a stretch. The other uh, chemical that has received really a, a great deal of attention is BPA or bisphenol A. Also, of course, because of its potential hormone disrupting uh, properties. Uh, this chemical, bisphenol A, is not used uh, on its own. That is, uh, uh, as what we call a monomer. It is used to produce a plastic, that is to link many bisphenol A units together in a chain. 
and form a polymer. That polymer is called polycarbonate. However, when you make a polymer, there always is the possibility of small amounts of your starting material left behind. So trace amounts of bisphenol A may be found in polycarbonate uh, plastics. But in order to make a, a polycarbonate plastic, what is done is to mix together bisphenol A, BPA, with phosgene. And this causes those two to link together, and the chain then extends in both directions. So this is polycarbonate. It is a polymer. But as you can see from here, the bisphenol A is no longer present. It has been incorporated into this long chain that we call a polymer. However, because no chemical reaction is ever perfect and, and can be expected to go to completion, there will always be trace amounts of bisphenol A lodged within this plastic that can then leach out. Well, in terms of knowing when you're dealing with polycarbonate uh, plastics, you can go by the recycling logo. This recycling logo has nothing to do with safety or with toxicity. It is totally designed to identify what the plastic is so that it can be properly recycled. So for example, number one, polyethylene terephthalate uh, is a type of polyester. High density polyethylene is number two. Polyvinyl chloride or PVC is number three. Low density polyethylene four, polypropylene five, polystyrene six. And whatever plastic doesn't fit into those categories is a number seven plastic. And polycarbonate is one of those. So polycarbonate will always have the number seven, but not all number seven is, uh, is polycarbonate. Well, where do we find polycarbonate? It is a very, very useful plastic because it is extremely hard. Uh, in fact, it is virtually bulletproof. This is why is it is used on, on meters. It is used on, in uh, uh, face shields and hockey helmets and, and football helmets because it is so tough. This is the shield around the uh, headlights of, of your car. Uh, you remember compact discs, which are no longer as in vogue as they used to be. They are made of polycarbonate. The protective uh, shields that police use, so-called riot gear, is made of polycarbonate because virtually nothing will uh, penetrate it. And these large carboys that you see sitting atop water coolers, uh, those are made of, of polycarbonate. Well, obviously, any time that water is in contact with polycarbonate, it is possible that the trace amounts of bisphenol A that may be left in the plastic can leach into the water. It is also possible that with time, some of the plastic decomposes. And when the plastic decomposes, it too can release uh, a small amounts of bisphenol A. Polycarbonates are also used in the making of uh, uh, various kinds of, of uh, uh, tooth materials. Uh, they are used in what is known as the white filling uh, in order to replace the amalgam filling. A lot of people these days don't want the amalgam filling because they're worried about the mercury. Well, the so-called white fillings are made of polycarbonate or very similar material, an epoxy material. And that can leach small amounts of bisphenol A into, into the body. Another possible connection, interestingly enough, uh, one that uh, doesn't get talked about as much, are all of these receipts uh, that we deal with now on a, a daily basis. And the ink that is used uh, on this so-called thermal paper is produced with bisphenol A. And when you handle this paper, small amounts get on the skin and indeed can travel into the bloodstream. I don't think this is uh, much of a problem for the average person. We just don't handle these all that much. But it is an issue for cashiers who work with this all day. And I think in those cases, it is a good idea for them to wear gloves. Uh, in order to solve this problem, 
there is now technology that is being introduced that does not rely on this kind of thermal paper and uh, does not involve the use of, uh, of bisphenol A. I don't think we have to be horrified by handling the occasional uh, receipt. But again, uh, even though it is occasional, it may add to the cumulative effect uh, of all of these endocrine disrupting chemicals to which we are uh, exposed. Epoxy glue, uh, very, very commonly used in all kinds of contexts because it's, it's extremely uh, effective glue. This is manufactured with bisphenol A. But once again, this is a polymer. So the monomer is not present, except for the same story that I, I told you is that there always is some remnant of the monomer and some of the final product always degrades so that it can release trace amounts of, of, of bisphenol A. But I think human exposure is most likely from the lining that is used in uh, canned foods. Now, the reason that this is used is to make sure that the food is not in contact with the metal of the can, uh, which is uh, usually aluminum or stainless steel, because you don't want metal leaching into, into the food, and you don't want the food reacting with the metal in order to create microscopic holes in the metal. So in order to protect the can, as well as protect the food, uh, this epoxy lining is, is used. And uh, again, it is possible that trace amounts of bisphenol A from this will leach into the food. But in science, we're always talking numbers. So the question is, how much? Is it enough to cause us some sort of concern? It does show up in the urine. People who eat a lot of canned foods will have more bisphenol in the urine which of course demonstrates that it is getting into the body and this most likely source is from canned food. Although of course it's not the, uh, the only source, uh, it can also happen from uh, water containers as, well, as, as I already uh, mentioned. So it is possible that it gets into, into the body. Now we have known since 1936, which is a long time ago, that's when bisphenol A was first synthesized. Uh, we have known since then that it has estrogen-like properties. And in fact, at that time, it was synthesized to be an estrogen mimic, possibly to be used as a medication for women who had reached the age of, of menopause. So we have long known that this has hormone-like properties. By 1995, it was very clear that exposure to polycarbonate plastics was a source of uh, bisphenol A in the environment. And this is when people began to focus on it, make measurements, and start to be concerned about this. But the biggest concern came with the polycarbonate baby bottle saga, which I I think many of you probably remember because it was a, a big story about, uh, I guess it goes back about uh, 15 years. Polycarbonate baby bottles uh, were very, very popular because they don't break. You can drop them and they don't break. When a glass bottle is dropped, it will break and that obviously results in a, a cleanup problem. So mothers were very happy to have these polycarbonate bottles. But then we began to hear uh, stories about bisphenol A possibly leaching out of the uh, polycarbonate. And uh, that's when uh, the demonstration started and the, the books and the pamphlets uh, about uh, toxic baby bottles and how we must do something uh, about this. And there were large demonstrations to uh, find alternatives to the polycarbonate uh, bottles. And there are certainly alternatives. Uh, there are other plastics, uh, the acrylics, for example, like plexiglass, you can use that. But of course, uh, you can al also go back to the, the glass bottle. So anyway, there are alternatives. And because the alternatives are, are there, uh, the government, 
to be totally on the safe side, said, all right, let's not use polycarbonate in baby bottles. Uh, not that we think that there's any real risk in the bisphenol A, but because there are alternatives that don't have that risk, let's use those. And uh, that doesn't mean that polycarbonate bottles uh, totally disappeared. These refillable water bottles that you find commonly in camping stores are made of polycarbonate. Uh, so there are many, many uh, bottles that are still available, but not baby bottles. And also let me point out that the water bottles that we drink from the most, although we shouldn't because we should be eliminating these plastic bottles. But anyway, these are made of polyester, not polycarbonate. So there is no bisphenol A issue here whatsoever. It's only the polycarbonate, the number seven plastic, that potentially has this, this issue. All right, well, what is the issue? What are the possible effects of bis bisphenol A? The first thing that, that uh, researchers do when they're confronted with a chemical that has potential toxicity is to determine the so-called no observed adverse effect level. That is the max maximum amount that can be ingested that has no effect. And this is uh, obviously determined with animals because ethically you cannot do such studies on, on humans. So what you do is you start giving your suspect chemical to an animal in increasing doses until you find that it does something. And then you cut back the dose to the maximum amount that causes no effect, and that's the NOAEL. So that's the maximum amount in an animal that has no effect. In order to arrive at what is called the human ADI, the acceptable daily intake, you take the NOAEL as determined from animals and divide it by a factor of 100 to give an increased hundredfold safety factor for, for humans. However, also very important to point out that the NOAEL refers to acute toxicity. That is, you feed the animal and you see what happens in a very short period of time. We can measure the amount of chemical that is, let's say, in water and compare it to the NOAEL. For example, you can take these polycarbonate bottles, store hot water in them, because hot water, of course, is a better solvent, and find out what happens. Well, it turns out that when you do this, one liter of water stored for 24 hours contains only one three thousandth the NOAEL which as I mentioned, already has a hundredfold safety factor built into it compared to the animal study. So we don't have to worry about the acute effect here of bisphenol A. But again, that's not what we're worried about. Nobody thinks that you're gonna take a swig from a polycarbonate bottle and drop dead. That's not the issue. It's not the acute effect we're worried about. We are worried about the chronic effect, the long-term effects. And that, of course, is very difficult to determine because you cannot use human trials. You, you can't take two groups of humans, expose one to small amounts of bisphenol A for 40 years and not the other group and see what happens. You can't do that. So once again, we have to refer to animals because you can do studies uh, on them. And you can study long-term effects, except that they're not really long-term effects in terms of humans because these animals don't live as long as we do. But nevertheless, this is the way that we have to proceed because you cannot do human trials. The first real concerning uh, such study was back in 1997 and came from the lab of Frederick Vomsal, University of Missouri, who found that there was prostate enlargement uh, when there was an exposure to uh, such chemicals in, in, in rodents. And that was concerning, but no one ever was able to repeat this study. It is still referred to as sort of the, the alarm, uh, but no one ever was able to repeat this. Uh, 
there have been other studies, and in this particular case, again, in, in mice, where they were exposed to BPA, and there was some involvement in the mammary gland tissue. So uh, obviously, uh, we take a look at this and, and start to be concerned, especially when you see stuff like this, where the uh, female mice uh, begin to exhibit more male-like behavior when they're exposed to liquids that have been stored in polycarbonate plastics. Uh, and then there was the suggestion that even obesity could be linked, that mice given water that had been stored in polycarbonate were more likely to be obese. But again, we're talking about mice and humans are not giant rodents. So it is always um, uh, a, you know, a bit of a stretch to come to a uh, conclusion too quickly based upon animal experiments. What we really have to ask is what about human studies? Are there any? Well, you cannot do human intervention studies, that is, give people bisphenol A to see what happens, but you can study blood levels, urine levels, due to the natural exposure, and see whether or not you can link it to any kind of a, a problem. So here, for example, was a study uh, back in 2008 where they measured blood levels and urine levels of bisphenol A and found that it was higher in people who had diabetes or, uh, or heart disease. Of course, once again, this is an association. This cannot prove cause and effect relationship. Uh, is it possible that uh, uh, these people had uh, these problems because they were eating a lot of uh, highly processed canned foods? And that, that would also cause an increase in their bisphenol A. But again, it's just another point on the graph, you know, that we need to uh, take into consideration, remembering though that an association cannot prove cause and effect. Occupational exposure uh, can be very informative because in this case, uh, people are exposed to much, much higher levels of a substance than on in common everyday exposure. So for example, in uh, chemical plants where uh, polycarbonate, for example, is manufactured, workers would be exposed to much higher le levels of, of bisphenol A. And in this case, in this Chinese factory, a uh, high dose of chemical uh, was linked to men's uh, sex problems. And of course, that certainly makes men pay attention. However, numbers again are important. And the exposure was more than 50 times greater than average North American exposure. Uh, 50 times, that's, that's a big number. So this can happen upon occupational exposure, but it's unlikely to have an effect on, on everyday uh, life. And furthermore, only about 20% of the men reported such, uh, such problems. But again, self-reporting is, is you know, a little bit questionable because men aren't always honest about uh, things like this. But at least there is some semblance of, of evidence that occupational exposure can cause a problem. <clears throat> One way, of course, of determining our exposure to bisphenol A is by measuring it in, in, in the urine. But therein lies another problem because... Uh, what we are measuring here, of course, is what comes out of the body. And uh, what is likely to cause a problem is what stays behind in the body. So uh, just because there's a lot of BPA coming out in the urine doesn't mean that it's doing anything in the body. It is, however, a measure of extent of exposure because where is it coming from? It has to be coming from somewhere to get into the body so that it can be... Uh, excreted. So monitoring urine is a measure of determining exposure. For example, people who eat a lot of canned food will have a higher level of bisphenol A in their urine. This is not so surprising because trace amounts of bisphenol A will leach into food from the epoxy lining and therefore show up in the, uh, in the urine. The question is, what happens in between ingestion and before it emerges from, from the urine. Now, in order to study that, uh, you have to design an experiment. 
whereby you take a look at, for example, in this case, 24-hour uh, human urine. You take samples for uh, 24 hours and you give people uh, food that is likely to have a lot of bisphenol A in it, like a lot of canned foods, and determine whether or not there's a relationship between the amount of canned food, let's say, and the uh, amount of uh, bisphenol A that comes out in the urine. And then you relate that to what is known about potentially toxic doses of bisphenol A. Well, it turns out that in this case, the, the active form of bisphenol A in, in, uh, in the blood, which is, of course, what you are really interested in, not the urine, because the urine is, is what comes out. So what they discovered here is that, that the amount uh, was not detectable by the instruments available. So you're detecting it in the urine, but you're not detecting it in, in the blood. So that means that there really isn't a significant amount that stays behind in, in the body. So again, you know, this is where it's important to note that when you're doing an experiment in the lab in a Petri dish, where you're exposing cells to bisphenol A, it is not the same as ingesting it and seeing what happens in the human body. Because the evidence here is that almost all of the ingested comes out because we detect it in the urine, but you're not finding it in the bloodstream. Anyway, once again, getting back to the numbers, uh, the European Food Safety Authority, FDA, Health Canada, based upon such experiments, have set a tolerable daily intake or the acceptable daily intake, 25 to 50 micrograms per kilogram a day. And when you do the studies, just like the ones that I described, the typical intake is about 0.05 micrograms per kilogram, which is far, far less than the uh, tolerable daily uh, intake. So there seems to be a pretty large margin of safety here. Even when you look at canned tuna, uh, which uh, in these experiments have been found to have the largest amount of bisphenol A, 200 parts per billion. But even at that level, the amount that we are exposed to is very, very little. As you can see, uh, it is still way below the tolerable daily uh, intake. So while it is quite clear that bisphenol A is an endocrine disruptor because you can demonstrate that in the laboratory. You can demonstrate, you know, taking cells, uh, you can show that it will trigger estrogenic activity. You can demonstrate that. Then we saw that there is some evidence from, from occupational exposure that it may have some effect on, on male uh, fertility and, and maybe uh, sexual response. But that is not likely to be a consequence of eating food that has trace amounts of bisphenol A because there just isn't enough there. Now, what about the business, as I mentioned, of handling these uh, cash receipts, the uh, thermal uh, receipts? Uh, interestingly enough, here the problem may be more significant than with ingestion because when you ingest something, it passes through the liver before it makes its way into the bloodstream. And the liver is the body's detoxicating organ, and it removes a lot of bisphenol A. However, when you're playing around with the cash receipts, it goes through the skin directly into the bloodstream. It does not have what we call first pass through the liver. So this actually may be a more significant uh, exposure, uh, especially if your fingers are moist, such as many people's fingers today are moist because of the hand sanitizers use, that very significantly can increase the amount of bisphenol A. So this would be a more significant route of exposure than, uh, than ingestion. And uh, here men can make use of this and uh, say that they need to avoid doing the shopping because it will interfere with their uh, manliness. Of course, you can still send your husband to go and do the shopping and just uh, tell him to wear gloves when he handles the, uh, uh, the cash receipt. Well, what do regulatory agencies around the world say? 
because these agencies enlist top-notch scientists, epidemiologists, reproductive specialists who really know what they're talking about. So you look, for example, at the European Food Safety Authority, the uh, EFSA. No consumer health risk from bisphenol A exposure. Then you look at the FDA, which is the American equivalent, the Food and Drug Administration. Again, they find in their experiments no low dose effects. Uh, e even when food is packaged in foil or in, in uh, uh, plastic wrap that can leach either phthalates or bisphenol A into the food, they don't find any problems. Health Canada, of course, also uh, has weighed in on this. And here's a very interesting uh, little uh, study that they did. 403 samples collected, all kinds of fruits, juices, beverages, vegetables, so really a cr cross-section of ed uh, everything. And um, so these were all uh, in cans because, of course, that's where you have the, the greatest chance of uh, uh, bisphenol A exposure. And even in these uh, juices and fruits and, and vegetables stored in the uh, cans, BPA was not detected in 98.5%. So only about 1.5% uh, had any BPA. And even that was at levels that were uh, inconsequential. So based on the overall weight of evidence, uh, what did Health Canada decide? That the current dietary exposure to BPA, to food packaging, is not expected to pose a health risk to the population, including children. And uh, again, this is in line with what uh, I just mentioned in terms of all the other uh, agencies around the world. Now, of course, uh, advertisers uh, will promote the fact that they are BPA free because BPA for many people has become sort of a, a frightening uh, term. And uh, obviously there are many plastics that are non-polycarbonate that you can make uh, without uh, BPA. But sometimes, these alternatives are very close relatives of BPA. So for example, bisphenol S, the only difference here is that that central sulfur, sulfur atom instead of a carbon atom. And as you can imagine, that doesn't make a whole lot of difference in the way that this molecule fits into a receptor. So although they can claim no BPA, uh, BPS is likely to have exactly the same kind of effect as uh, BPA. So this really amounts to nothing more than a, a marketing uh, gimmick. On the other hand, there are a number of other plastics that really are not at all like polycarbonate and don't have any BPA. Tritan is one of these. And uh, this is a very, very good plastic. It is, again, very tough, almost as tough as polycarbonate. And you can make very useful items out of it. Uh, I have one of these mugs uh, that you see on the right here. I, I find it to be excellent. Uh, it's double walled, so it holds in heat uh, or cold uh, extremely well. And there's no chance of uh, BPA leaching uh, out, of, out of this. So over the years, BPA has been thoroughly examined. Believe it or not, there are more than 8,000, 8,000 scientific papers that have been published uh, on, on bisphenol A. So if there were some really significant danger here, I think we would have found it. But the fact is that when you focus the spotlight on any single chemical so intensely, study it in every possible way, you are going to find some issues. So yes, you will find some, some experiment that shows that BPA makes some, uh, the daughters of some mice more lazy. Uh, of course, here the exposure would have been way more than anything that we are exposed to. Uh, you can go and find some sort of container that may have a high level of, 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 of BPA. But how, how can this be, you know, that, that you have um, on, one side, all these regulatory agencies who say that really there's not much here to worry about. And then you have some researchers uh, who come to totally different conclusions. Well, there, there are all kinds of possible reasons for this. They may not be looking at the same thing. And this is what I, I, I said that when you put something under the 
you know, proverbial microscope and you examine it in every possible way, you will find some effect. So it depends on at what level of development of the animal you're, you're looking at. It depends on the extent of exposure. It depends on whether it's oral exposure or transdermal uh, exposure or inhaled exposure. So it's not surprising that you get these kind of different uh, effects. So how do we define what is true or false? By looking really at the consensus. Uh, in science, we always look for the preponderance of evidence. And in this case, uh, the regulatory agencies maintain that uh, there is no real big issue here. They don't say that there's no issue at all. There may be. And we, we can't put aside the fact that sperm counts have been falling. That's for sure. It's just a question of why that is, is the case. Is it maybe just the overall diet? Uh, is it maybe because uh, uh, of some other lifestyle factor? Can it have something to do with, with uh, uh, smoking or with alcohol intake or air pollution? Uh, so there are many factors that have to be taken into account. Uh, when it comes to controversies like this, both sides seem to be wedded to results that support their position and they will cherry pick data that supports what, what they say. Uh, but we have to get past of, past, you know, these kind of, you know, political uh, views and, and ideological issues and really sit down and just look, uh, look at the uh, evidence. But not all of the evidence is in. And, uh, you know, when you look at someone like Ramsal who has forged a career on showing that these environmental disrupting chemicals are the scourge of society, he's not going to change his mind. And you know he will go on saying things like this, when you feed baby out of clear hard plastic bottles, like giving a baby a birth control pill, this is total nonsense. That birth control pill has estrogenic potential 50,000 times greater than the amount that a BPA that can be uh, ingested. But he still keeps on making uh, making this uh, allegation. Uh, another problem is that that you know uh, when you have these subtle effects, a great deal of money is devoted to to try to clarify them, and that money is very often siphoned away from other research that could be more uh, more fruitful. So it's not a question of endocrine disruptors not being real. I think they are real. But I think the effects are, are relatively small compared to other things that we need to worry about in life. But let me just finish off by get, getting back to, to Shana Swan. Uh, now, she uh, is a good researcher. And uh, uh, as I said, there's no question about the falling uh, rate of, of, of sperm production and sperm motility. The question is why and what is really uh, going on. Uh, she uh, is wedded to the idea that it is various kind of chemicals in the environment that are responsible. And, uh, you know, she may be right about some of, some of this. So, uh, for example, uh, she says uh, pesticides can be a problem. That's true. Some pesticides like chlorpyrifos certainly uh, have estrogen-like effects. So, uh, therefore, she urges that we should be eating organic because that reduces the amount of exposure to, to pesticides. Then we should be eating less processed foods. Well, of course, that's good advice for any reason. Uh, yes, because processed foods are more likely to be packaged in substances that can release uh, hormone-like uh, uh, chemicals. They're more likely to be made with uh, substances that have uh, hormone-like properties. So that, I think that's, uh, that's good advice. Uh, reduce meat intake. Uh, yes, I think this also uh, has scientific basis for many, many reasons. Her reason is that meat is very often packaged in plastic and processed uh, using uh, uh, plastic equipment, and this can leach remnants of, of plastic substances into the food. Uh, she urges us to cut down on uh, single-use plastics, and of course we should be doing that. Uh, this is an environment mental nightmare, beside the fact that it can leach various kinds of substances into the environment. She says, trade in your shower curtain for cotton-based curtain. 
well, you know what, I think that's a little bit excessive and I am not trading in my ducky curtain for any cotton curtain. Uh, she says, uh, be careful about your furniture. Don't buy furniture that has flame retardants in it because those leach out and have, have endocrine properties. But then again, if there's a fire, uh, you'll do a lot better with fire retardant furniture. Flame retardants are found all over the place. And yes, there, there may be a reason to keep them away from babies, uh, such as, you know, the changing pads and, and uh, nursing pillows and stuff like that. There may be something uh, to that. So I think she uh, may be correct here. Uh, she urges us to stay away from nonstick cookware that's made with Teflon. I don't think that there's any real issue here with the cookware. Uh, but there is an issue with the manufacture of Teflon. And remnants of PFOA, a chemical used to make Teflon, can get into the environment, but I think you're safe with the Teflon cookware. In terms of microwave, uh, she says we should only be using glass or ceramic in the microwave oven. That's true. I agree. I would agree with that. Uh, stay away from uh, air fresheners because this is a way to basically put phthalates into the air that you breathe. Uh, these are formulated with phthalates to keep the, the scent there longer. Uh, she says, stay away from wall-to-wall uh, -wall carpeting because that's a dust magnet and dust contains a lot of these environmental uh, estrogenic uh, compounds. And in order to protect that dust from building up, leave your shoes outside. That also is a good idea because you can trudge in pesticide residues, all kinds of things from the outside. And you don't need the bevy of cleaning agents that people have in their homes, many of which contain substances like, uh, like glycols that have hormone-like properties. You can do a lot of cleaning with just vinegar and baking soda. So I think she's got a lot of, of decent advice. And if you are more interested in stuff like this, we have a lot of this on our website. Uh, you can go there. You can also sign up there for a weekly newsletter. And of course, there are thousands of other articles there uh, that would uh, be uh, to your interest. So I hope I've been able to give you a little bit of a background here on this whole problem of uh, hormone-like chemicals. It's an interesting story, uh, but uh, I think that there are more important things in life to, to worry about. But nevertheless, we need to keep abreast of the research. Okay, that is it for today. I don't know if we have any uh, uh, questions. With the canned foods, I really don't eat canned foods. But if I were to eat canned foods, I would saute it with some garlic and stuff in a tad bit of olive oil. Would that help to reduce the no, uh, chemical? It wouldn't, make a, it wouldn't make a difference. But uh, okay. I, if you're going to worry about canned food, I would say the bigger worry about is about the salt content, not the bisphenol A. Wonderful. I don't eat a lot of canned foods, though, because it gives me headaches. Okay. Um, I remember growing up, my parents, so they did something right. My mom always fed the children with glass bottles. They broke. My dad had to get some more, and she had seven kids to take care of, and, and I never eat food in plastic. Never. Yeah, but in, in those days, there probably was nothing other than glass bottles. <laughs> I'm not that old, Dr. Schwartz. <laughs> oh, Dr. Schwartz, thank you so much. Very enlightening okay. stuff. Okay. Okay, Dr. Schwartz? Yeah. Um, thank you very much for your talk, and thanks for putting these talks on. Uh, myself, or my family, and, and the community really appreciate everything you're doing. My question that I have for you is a little... I almost detected a, uh, a contradiction in your presentation when you mentioned that um, um, people that ate canned goods had higher uh, BPA in their in their systems, but then when government findings could only find or in ninety eight or was it ninety eight point five percent of cases couldn't find any uh, bisphenol A in the products. So what's going on there? Oh, okay. It, it's a, a question of detection technology. Uh, because when, when you do the studies on, on blood and urine, 
uh, you can detect much, much smaller amounts than you would detect when you do the surveys in, in, in canned foods. Uh, that's uh, the canned food that is, is done by something called gas chromatography, whereas when they do it in the blood, it's called by it's done by immunoassay, when you can detect much, much smaller amounts. But anyway, the, the important thing to, to remember is that uh, uh, when you do the body studies, even though you find significant concentration in the urine, it doesn't mean anything unless you would find parallel concentrations in the blood. Because remember, the urine is what is coming out of your body. That's not really what we're interested in. That may be a measure of how much is going into your body. But what we're interested in is how much stays in the body. And that's where the blood levels are important. So in the study that I mentioned, whereas they found it in the urine, they found almost none in the, in the blood, even though you may be able to find quite a bit in what is going into the body by measuring what's in the canned food. Do you follow? Yep, I do. Okay. Okay. Can I ask another sort of, or kind of related, but not related question? Yeah. Okay. So I know you were taught, you, a lot of your presentation was bisphenolase and, and, and phthalates. But when you talk about like the, uh, the plastics recycling numbers, ones and twos, things that like water bottles, juice bottles, things like that, are there other chemicals that leach out into the, you know, the waters, the juices, that sort of thing that any are... Any time, listen, any time that you have two surfaces in contact with each other, there will always be transfer of material between those two surfaces. Right. You put down your hand on, on a desk and we can detect remnants of your hand after you've removed it, uh, because now we can detect things down to parts per trillion. So there always will be some stuff that exchanges. The question is what it is and how much. And, and uh, so, for example, uh, the most commonly used plastic today is polyethylene. And uh, if you store something in polyethylene and you measure how much leaches out, you will find... Uh, dimers and trimers of, of, of ethylene, but it's of no consequence because those have no hormone-like uh, properties. So just because something is there doesn't mean it's doing something. You, you have to know what it is and how it might behave in the body, what its biological importance it is, and you also need to know how much there is. So, yes, while it may be the case that when you're dealing with polyester or polyethylene, you find some plastic remnants leaching out, but they're of no consequence because they have no biological activity. Okay, so that's that's the issue. There's really, there's no, like, because, I mean, everybody's so concentrated on on the, the phthalates, the bisphenol A's, but I was just making right, sure because that there's those, nothing. You can, you, can demonstrate, nothing. you can demonstrate in the lab that those have biological activity. Yeah, sure. Okay. Okay. I thank you so much. Uh, great okay, explanations. Uh, there's one last question, Dr. Schwartz. Okay. Um, Shirley is asking, please reference products such as cling wrap and saran wrap and their use in the microwave. Uh, as a general rule, when you use these wraps in the microwave, you do not want them in contact with the food. So you don't wrap the food in, a, in, in plastic and heat it. But if you have a glass bowl, it's okay to cover it with, with the wrap as long as it's not in contact with the food. Thank you, Dr. Schwartz. Do you have any last words or words of wisdom for the end of the lecture? Uh, we will eventually get out of this COVID mess. <laughs> I don't know when, but it's a bigger worry than hormone disrupting chemicals. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you to right. everyone listening in through Zoom and the telephone. And thank you very much, Dr. Schwartz, okay. for your lovely um, lecture. Bye. Bye.